right here. Blue. Check in this room back here. Hello, please. One, two, three. Making good. Uh, I'm checking here. Okay. No, you're good. Wait. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One more. On January 4th, 2023, police officers in the city of Enoch, Utah, conducted a wellness check on the home of the Haight family. After forcing entry, they found all eight family members brutally shot to death. It was an incident that took the tiny town of Enoch completely by surprise. With just a few thousand residents, Enoch simply wasn't the kind of place where things like this happened. Compounding it all was the fact that the hates were beloved members of the community. They were church-going folk who personified the term family values in everything they did. In most cases of family annihilation, the perpetrator is the father, who can usually be described as an educated, middle-aged professional with deep-seated psychological issues. Many of these cases also involve major warning signs that often go unnoticed or even ignored by the people of the community. Today, we'll unpack how these factors played into the Hate Family Massacre, an incident that represents the shocking rise in familicide that's being seen across America. It's a story that shows how monsters can sometimes lie in plain view, and how their destructive fury leaves nothing in its wake but shattered pieces of the family they claimed to care for. Michael Haight and Tasha Earle met at Southern Utah University and immediately bonded over their Christian values. Michael was, in many ways, the man of Tasha's dreams, or at least he appeared that way. And in all honesty, Tasha had no reason to suspect he was any different. This was a man who'd gone to Brazil on a two-year mission for the Church of the Latter-day Saints. He had a business degree and a budding career at Allstate, where he quickly became a star insurance salesman. When Tasha looked at him, she saw the kind of future she had always dreamed of. They got married on May 16, 2003, when Michael was 23 and Tasha was 21. It was a simple ceremony at St. George Temple, but one that was full of joy and hope for the future. The couple settled in the tightly knit community of Enoch and did what all newly married people do, made babies. First came Macy, who was 17 years old at the time of the incident. Then came Briley, who was 12 years old and whose text messages would later provide a window into the absolute nightmare of a life the hates were living under their tyrannical patriarch. The twins, Sienna and Ammon, were seven when they lost their lives. Ammon's fate, in particular, would give a startling peek into the crazed, violent mind of his father. Finally, there was Gavin, who at four years old somehow didn't warrant any empathy from his deranged murderer. But all of that violence came later. At the outset, the hates were wholesome, loving folk who fit so completely into Enoch's rustic tapestry that the community could hardly imagine life without them. Michael very much considered himself to be a patriarch in the most Old Testament sense of the word. Tasha, a deeply devout woman, embraced her role as a stay-at-home mom, a decision that aligned with her values but also made her more vulnerable to Michael's control. She took pride in teaching her kids the words of the gospel and the glory of Jesus Christ. She felt it was her responsibility to bring her kids up right and to let her husband be the sole breadwinner. However, this also meant that Michael had complete control over every aspect of Tala's life. He was a very controlling man, to the point where he forced Tala to cut baby wipes in half before using them and wash out plastic bags to store them. These could have been simple cost-cutting measures, and with a family of six to feed, Michael may have needed to be as frugal as possible to make ends meet. But based on the way his career was going, money shouldn't have been a problem. Michael had an almost legendary reputation at Allstate, with customers often driving miles just to be able to buy insurance from him. It was his customer service that made him stand out. Just like many other abusers, Michael knew how to turn on the charm, and people tended to trust every word he said when he had the mask on. As a result, the hates were never really strapped for cash. Yet Michael still acted like their belts needed considerable tightening. Just before Christmas in 2022, he received a large bonus from his employer. It was the kind of cash that most people would use to take their family on vacation, pay for their kids' braces, or maybe get some renovations done in the family home. In the case of the hates, no one really knew where this money went. It definitely didn't go toward buying Christmas presents for the children, because when the topic came up, Michael gave Tala a grand total of $500 to buy gifts for all of the children. In this case, 
Tala showed just how resourceful she could be. She managed to get gifts that her children truly enjoyed and essentially saved Christmas single-handedly. Her husband did nothing to help, something that likely angered Tala, but she focused her energies on making sure that her kids got to enjoy this special time of the year. This wasn't the only time Tala had to rely on her own ingenuity. Michael hated spending money, even if it was for necessary expenses. On one occasion, he noticed that the dining table was scuffed up and responded by flying into a rage about how undisciplined the children were. Tala, on the other hand, went out to buy some supplies from her own allowance and repaired the table herself. This was a risky move too, because Michael never hesitated to show his wrath if she spent more than what he allowed her to. He allotted her $300 for groceries and not a penny more, and when Tala once spent an extra $30 to replace a rug, he exploded with fury, saying that Tala should have bought fewer groceries or compensated for the extra $30 in some other way. There's no doubt that Michael enjoyed holding this power over his wife. At the very least, he flaunted it at every chance he got. At some point during their marriage, Michael took Tala's phone and car keys away with the sole purpose of making her more dependent on him. In early 2022, he bought her a brand new car but told the salesman that he'd only let her drive it if she earned the privilege. It bears mentioning that Tala had already kicked Michael out of the house once after getting fed up with his abusive antics. Michael went to live with his mom and got therapy, but this was only to get back into Tala's good graces. As soon as he returned, the cycle of abuse began again. It seemed like each time Tala tried to get away, he only tightened his grip on her. Tala faced an impossible choice, escape the abuse or risk her children being left vulnerable if Michael were granted custody. You see, he wasn't just financially abusive, in fact, that was just the tip of the iceberg. By the way, I post true crime and new cases here every day, so if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing, it helps a lot. The one thing Michael cared about more than anything else was appearances. He went to church not because he was a God-fearing man but because he wanted to be seen going to church. He wanted members of the community to see him as this upright patriarch, a defender of the very institution of family, a provider who never let his children want for anything. The fact that he was a short-tempered miser was not something he'd let anyone outside his family see. As for the family itself, well, they just had to deal with it. They had to toe the line. Otherwise, Michael wouldn't hesitate to use physical force. The person who faced the brunt of his violent wrath was probably Macy. Most dads would treat their firstborn daughter like a princess, they'd be fiercely protective, and seeing them cry would feel like a knife twisting in their own hearts. In Michael's case, he seemed to relish any opportunity to make his daughter cry. He didn't just do it through words, he caused her actual physical pain. Based on reports, the physical abuse started in 2017 when Macy was just 11 years old. How anyone could feel anger toward a child so young, especially one described as innocent and kind like Macy, is something most of us will never understand. And yet, it came naturally to the monster that was Michael. In 2020, Michael went so far as to violently throttle his daughter to the point where she thought she might die. Even though she was just 14, Macy knew this wasn't something she should have to deal with, so she filed a police report. Unfortunately, the police, like pretty much every other institutional authority in Enoch, sided with the abuser. That's not to say they thought what Michael did was justified, Rather, they failed to do anything about it. Essentially, all they did was tell Michael he'd been a bad boy and that he should behave. This is what the officer wrote in his report, word for word. I advised Michael that his behavior was very close to assaultive. I advised him that I did not intend to charge him with any crime at this time. I talked to him about the importance of Macy continuing to speak with a therapist. I asked him not to interfere with that. I also advised him that he should continue seeing someone about his anger. I advised him that I would much rather be having this conversation with him instead of taking him to jail. It's a strange world where choking your own daughter is seen as being close to assaultive. It's stranger still that no charges were filed. Of course, this wouldn't be the last time that the so-called protectors of the community would fail to help the people Michael was terrorizing. In January 2021, Macy filed a report with the Utah Division of Child and Family Services, saying that her father started screaming at TAA while driving on the freeway and swerving the car so violently that the children were left with red marks from their seat belts. The report also stated that he'd thrown Macy headfirst into a couch. The agency apparently didn't even accept the report. On December 8, 2022, Macy filed yet another report with DCFS, 
stating that her father had thrown Ammon to the ground. Agents arrived at the Haight home but left without interviewing Michael. All they did was tell Macy to call the police if she felt unsafe. The year 2022 was an extremely depressing time for Macy. She was in high school, and her dad constantly pressured her to get good grades. She'd been repeatedly failed by the institutions put in place to help her, even though she did every single thing right. The rage you feel right now is justified. Everyone should be angry about the way things went for the hates, especially considering how the story ends. But to make things even more tragic, TAA was this close to getting away when Michael lost all control. Just like her daughter, TAA was trying to find a way to neutralize the Michael-shaped threat in her life however she could. While Macy talked to police and other government authorities, TAA tried to talk to LDS leadership, hoping that they could give her claims some credibility in front of the police. The church leaders did nothing to help her. Multiple complaints went nowhere. The hates were left to fend for themselves. Realizing that she'd have to get herself out of this situation, TAA started saving up what little allowance Michael gave her. The year 2022 was also when she lost weight, started getting manicures, and generally engaged in self-care. Unsurprisingly, Michael didn't like this one bit. TAA didn't care. She was planning to divorce him and had spoken to an attorney in December 2022 to set the wheels in motion. All the years of abuse had taken their toll, and she could see that Macy was truly suffering. There was just no way she could let this go on. But the thing is, Michael's not the sort of person to let go of the things he wants. And based on how things were going in his life, he was hurtling toward a violent outbreak that would wipe his own family off the face of the earth. Though he'd been a solid worker at Allstate for years, Michael found himself sitting opposite his boss at the end of 2022, having a most difficult conversation. He was getting fired for a policy violation. It turned out that Michael had been committing fraud, and the higher-ups at the company had finally found out about it. He made plans to start an insurance company of his own, but with something like that on his record, his career in insurance was effectively over. Michael's job was an enormous source of pride for him, and so was his family. When TAA revealed that she was going to divorce him, it pushed him past the breaking point. All of a sudden, it felt like everything was falling apart. And considering how much Michael cared about his public image, it's fair to say that he'd rather die than live on as a failure. But the thing is, he didn't think that he was to blame for this stroke of bad luck. Rather, he blamed his family for somehow holding him back. In the first few days of the new year, he removed all firearms from the home, effectively confiscating T's means of defending herself. On January 3rd, he started secretly recording videos around the house. Can I give you a big hug? No, I'm. How about pickles? We can go to the mountains, maybe tomorrow or the next day. Michael made many such recordings throughout the house, some of which included, Do you need my help? You three go in together. Yes. Yeah, okay. Come here. These recordings also reveal that T had told Michael she was divorcing him and depict him trying to talk his way out of it. It makes it look like you're abandoning your family, so that can be an argument used against a parent that leaves. I'm a little curious why you're so wanting me so aggressively to just move out of here, too, you know, and not let the system play out. And why, why you're feeling like you have to get some motion to remove me from here. Our kids have mentioned, especially our older two, have mentioned that when you're here, it is more tense. Michael also seems to put on a show, crying about how hard he tries to be a good father. I do help provide and try to be a good husband for you, and I'm sorry I have fallen short in ways. On top of that, T makes it very clear that she's not going to tolerate his abuse anymore. You do need help. I hope you can get it. I want you to. I told you I deserve to be treated so much better. You have shut those down every time, so I don't have a voice, Mike. I don't have a voice. I will have freedom now. At around 3 a.m. on January 4th, Mere hours after T told Michael in no uncertain terms that their marriage was over, people living close by reported hearing a series of loud bangs. They assumed they came from fireworks, but the truth was Michael had just shot his entire family to death. The following morning, a friend that T had planned to meet with called the police to conduct a wellness check when she didn't show up. I'm a little bit concerned. We had, we were supposed to, um, we had an appointment scheduled, but she missed it, and she doesn't, never misses appointments. I think the violence has been more with the kids, but he has been with her. But I don't think it's been reported. He was refusing to leave the home, and that's what the paperwork was. 
she was going to file paperwork to get him out. Later on, another wellness check was requested for Michael when he didn't show up for his appointments either. This prompted police to head to the Hate residence, where they found what remained of the family. Got one more gunshot wound to the back of the head. Victim, police. If you're down here, make yourself known. Two, four, six doors. Right. Hold right there. Got it. Every single member of the Haight family had been shot in the head while they slept. For some reason, seven-year-old Ammon was shot multiple times, indicating that Michael perhaps held a special hatred for his middle child. The presence of teeth fragments in the wall also suggests that Michael failed to murder his son with the first shot, prompting Ammon to try to crawl away as his father aimed for the kill shot. After massacring his family, Michael had gone to the exercise room and shot himself in the head. He left behind a suicide note blaming everything on T, claiming that she'd been manipulative and didn't appreciate everything he did. The community was left shocked. But the most infuriating part of this story, the part that will make you lose faith in humanity, is how local authorities responded to questions during the press conference. We, we had been, uh, involved in some investigations with the family a couple of years prior. Um, at this moment, I'd rather not. But, but we were familiar with the family, yes. Was there anything recent? Or anything that, since the divorce papers were filed, was there a protective order or anything? Nothing recent that law enforcement was aware of. No accountability. No shame for the warning signs they ignored. A whole community, supposedly one that acted like a family, looked at a violent man creeping ever closer to what now seems inevitable and turned away. There will be no justice for T, Macy, Briley, Sienna, Ammon, and Gavin. Local children's advocates summed it up as well as anyone could by saying, if we think about Macy at this point as a victim of child abuse, she really did everything the system asks of her. And now, effectively, all she has to show for that is a marble slab over her body with her name on it.